Good evening. My name is Art Benjamin. I'm professor of mathematics here at Harvey Mudd College, and I want to welcome you to the fall 2013 Michael Moody Mathematics Lecture. Michael Moody was a cherished friend, mentor, and inspiration to the Department of Mathematics. Moody came to the college in 1994, and in 1996, he became HMC's first Diana and Kenneth Johnson professor and was named a chairman of the Department of Mathematics. During his time as department chair from 1996 through 2002, the department hired eight new faculty, bringing the total number of mathematics faculty to 12. Moody wanted to hire people who would mesmerize and inspire students in the classroom and who had a passion for their mathematical work. He gave the department what he called an animating goal to be recognized as one of the very best departments of mathematics in the country. The department credits Moody as the guiding force be, uh, to receiving, in 2006, the American Mathematical Society's inaugural award for an outstanding program in mathematics. HMC was singled out for this achievement among all undergraduate and graduate mathematics departments in the United States. At the time of his death in January 2010, Moody was Vice President for Academic Affairs and founding Dean of Faculty at Olin College in Massachusetts. That spring, the HMC Alumni Association recognized Mike Moody as an honorary alumnus in recognition of his many contributions to the college. The Moody Lecture Series was established uh, by the Mathematics Department to honor Mike's legacy at Harvey Mudd College. It is supported by gifts from Mike's family, friends, colleagues, and former students. This is our fifth Michael Moody Lecture Series, and, and in the first four, we've had the pleasure of Joni Moody, Mike's widow, in the audience. This, uh, unfortunately, Joni was not able to make, uh, to make tonight's presentation. Uh, but we are, however, honored to have President Clave in the audience tonight. Uh, let me introduce our speaker, Jennifer Quinn. Jenny has her bachelor's degree in mathematics from Williams College, her PhD in mathematics from University of Wisconsin. She's currently professor of mathematics at University of Washington, Tacoma, and has served as the associate director for interdisciplinary arts and sciences there. Jenny has also served as the executive director of the Association for Women in Mathematics, as co-editor of Math Horizons magazine, and, as, uh, and is currently serving as second vice president of the Mathematical Association of America. Jenny has received numerous teach awards for her teaching and writing. She's received the HAMO Award, which is the MAA's premier award for an outstanding uh, professor of mathematics. Uh, she's received the Beckenbach Prize for her book, uh, Proofs That Really Count, which uh, for uh, in, in mathematics. Jenny is currently writing two books this year on her sabbatical. One is a work of fiction called Phoebe and Blaze. The other is a sequel to our book, Proofs that really count, proofs that really count too. <laughs> now I should tell you that the first book had as its subtitle, The Art of Combinatorial Proof, which some people thought was a reference to me. Uh, <laughs> therefore, in all fairness, the subtitle to the sequel will be Quintessential Combinatorial Proofs. <laughs> With that said, please, well, please get ready to rumble as Jenny presents Mathematics to Die For, the battle between counting and matching. Jenny. <laughs> We're still a motorcycle. <laughs> You're going to have to do better than that. Wow, I am so honored to be here. Um, I was amused listening to the introduction that Art neglected to say we co-edited Math Horizons together, because um, usually he doesn't miss a beat when it comes to promoting the things that he's done. <laughs> for almost 20 years to count him as my uh, favorite professional colleague. Um, being here and speaking at the Mike Moody Lecture is really something very special. Uh, I had known, I knew Mike 
when he arrived here. And, and I consider Harvey Mudd my second mathematical home. It's been one of these places where I have always felt welcomed. Um, it is a department of incredible, brilliant, creative, and fun people that I have continued my association with when I moved out of the area. And Mike was one of those people. Mike, I consider a mentor, even though I was not a faculty member here. Uh, he is someone I would call upon when I was department chair and I needed help trying to figure out how to deal with my unruly faculty, or <laughs> how to handle some tenure and promotions. He was fabulous coming up with external reviewer recommendations. Um, he was really someone I looked up to and relied on. So being here and speaking in his honor um, is really a huge highlight for me. So with that, I want to warn you that you are expected to make noise for this talk. Um, you are expected to participate, and I hope you'll have fun and enjoy it in the spirit with which it is being offered. So with that, I'd like to start proofs that really count. No. <laughs> Mathematics to die for <laughs> the battle between counting and matching. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome, welcome one and all. Welcome mathematicians of all varieties. Today you are here to witness a mathematical competition between two techniques, counting and matching. <laughs> It is a rare treat to experience such a combinatorial cage match. <laughs> you might call it a battle of brainiac proportions, an arithmetic assault, a mathematical smackdown. <sighs> so without further ado, I would like to introduce the contestants for this evening. You have known her all your life, and she is representing <laughs> counting, counting. She is quite familiar. It is something she has been known to you for a very long time. How else do you count? Her favorite mathematical technique is to ask a question and answer it in two different ways. I give to you, representing counting, our contestant, the Countess. <clears throat> Her opponent, representing matching, is a newcomer to the scene. He hasn't been appreciated, but once you get to know him and his techniques, you will love him as much as I do. He is known to attack in pairs, and he has no fear of the negative sign. <clears throat> and one of his best moves is to use his opponent's techniques against them. His favorite technique is something called description involution I exception D I E mathematics to die for. I give you representing matching Sir Matchalot. <laughs> Is there anybody here who's been to one of these competitions before? <laughs> I think you're missing something. So I think that means I need to explain to you the rules of engagement. Here's the way this works. There will be three rounds to the competition. And in each round, there will be specified a sum and and a range. The Countess 
has to take that sum and and compute a closed form formula for the complete sum. Sir Matulot takes that, that sum and and that range, and he counts a, he computes a closed form form formula for the alternating sum, where the signs change from positive to negative as you go along. Once they do this, they will present it to you. Uh, there are no other rules to this competition, except that you get to rate who you think wins each round. I don't care how you choose. It might be you like the cut of their jib. It might be you think the result is just more beautiful. Or it might be you think their technique is worthy of recognition. As the judges, you should probably decide now what's important to you. Be true to your technique and be fair. All right. Here's an example, just in case it wasn't clear enough of what to expect. If the sum end is 1, just 1, and the range is from 1 to n, that means that the countess needs to compute what the answer is for, let me see if I can point, for 1 plus 1 plus 1 n times. Okay. Sir Matchelot is supposed to compute 1 minus 1 plus 1 minus 1 all the way until we get to the nth term. And then the sign is going to depend on the, on the parity of n, whether it's positive or negative. So let's just make sure you understand what is the answer that the countess should present to us. What is the answer Sir Matchelot is going to present to us? <laughs> Sorry. I, okay. I heard a lot of answers. All right. I heard a smart ass answer from the front row. <laughs> But what was common to all the answers was it depends on the parity of n. And if we're not going to try and be obtuse, but be as clear as possible, the answer we should see is 0 if n is even, positive 1 if n is odd. Do we all agree? Yes. Fantastic. I love seeing all the heads match. Rumble. OK. So what is it that we should expect from these contestants in our competition today? Okay, what are the skills that they bring to the table? Well, the countess is known to use the binomial coefficient n choose k. All you need to know about n choose k to follow what the countess is doing today is that it counts the number of ways to pick a subset of size k from an n element set. You do not need to compute it, even though you probably know how. But all you need to know is what it represents combinatorially, what it is counting. So n choose k, the binomial coefficient. Sir Matchelot's best skill is cancellation. He likes to take any number and match it up with a number of similar magnitude but opposite sign. So when they come together, total annihilation. <laughs> now, it's true that the number he's usually matching up is going to be 1 and negative 1. But it's not always true. So be prepared to match anything and everything. <sighs> Where's the sound? I'm just asking. There is sound on this slide. <laughs> Did we lose it? 
I, it should go without me doing anything. Let's try it one more time. No? Oh, this, is, this really is meant to get the crowd going. <laughs> Here, I'll, I'll do it for you. Just imagine. Let's get ready to rumble! <gasps> okay. You ready? There we are! Y'all ready for this? Oh, what happened? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. I tried. <laughs> <coughs> Challenge one. Are you excited? Yeah. Okay, let's go. The summon is K. That's the indexing variable itself. Okay, the summon is K, and the range is that K goes from one to zero. N. <laughs> one to N. That means that the countess has to come up with a closed form for 1 plus 2 plus 3 all the way up to plus n. And Sir Matulot has to come up with his closed form for 1 minus 2 plus 3 minus 4 up to plus or minus n. All right? So what we're going to do is we're going to send the contestants off to soundproof booths, give them some time to come up with their presentation, but we have a real treat today. <coughs> and our treat, oops, <coughs> I have to get rid of the laser pointer. Our treat is that we have a closed circuit camera above the Countess's workspace. So we can see her preparing to come out and present her solution. <laughs> so the idea is she needs to find a a combinatorial representation for the integer k. Okay, k is an integer. And look, it looks like she says that if you take a set with, oh, well, maybe she didn't like what she said. What, what is it? She picked a set with k elements and was asking for a representative. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. It would work. Oh, but. I guess she's modifying it a little. Let's see. For a fixed k, create an ordered pair a k plus 1. OK, so for a fixed k, we, we fix the largest element, and we vary what's the smaller piece of the ordered pair. OK, and we look at how many choices there are for such a pair. OK. Oh, I think she's happy with that. Look, there's a smiley face. OK, so if k, let's see what she wrote down here. If, if k is, let's say, n, then the largest element of the pair is going to be n plus 1. And any of the integers 1, 2, 3, up to n can be the first element of the ordered pair, right? OK, so indeed, if she's counting pairs a, k plus 1, where a is less than or equal to k, there will be k choices. So she has a concrete realization for what this integer k represents. So she's ready to come and present. Let's see what she does. Question. She's going to ask a question and answer it in two different ways, right? Question. How many pairs of distinct numbers can be chosen from 1 to n plus 1? We saw her preparing this. We know what the answer is, right? The answer is the sum, the sum that we are expecting. Because if you count pairs based on the largest number in the pair, okay, if the largest number is k plus 1, then that number is going to range from 2 to n plus 1. K itself is going to range from 1 to n. Fabulous. So we'll end up with summing over all possible values of k to get 1 plus 2 all the way up to n. So the first answer to her question is the sum she's asked to solve. That's good. What's the second answer to her question? What's her favorite technique? 
binomial coefficients. And answer two is the binomial coefficient. N plus one choose two. So she's done it, ladies and gentlemen. She has solved her answer. She's shown that the sum from one to N is the binomial coefficient. N plus one choose two. And I think that deserves a round of applause. <laughs> All right, Sir Matchelot's turn. Let's see what he does. <sighs> Didn't I tell you he liked to use people's techniques against them? He's doing exactly the same thing. He's using ordered pairs A, K plus 1, where A is strictly less than K plus 1. He's using exactly the same idea. But notice his color coding. The things that are blue count positively, and the things that are gold count negatively. So what is he going to do? What does he do? That's his description. We're expecting an involution. So he's going to match up ordered pairs, one positive one with one negative one, because what's one plus negative one, folks? Zero. And if it's zero, it goes away. And we should end up with what the leftovers are. All right, the involution. Oh, interesting. So do you see what he's done? If A plus B, if the sum of the elements in the ordered pair is odd, <clears throat> then he adds one to the second element. But if the sum of the ordered pair is even, he subtracts one. Do you see that if the sum of the pair is even, the components are either both even or both odd? So they have to differ by at least two? So we're always allowed to subtract one? That's a legitimate move, and we end up <clears throat> coming up with a bijection where it exists. It matches things up. It gives us a positive and a negative term to annihilate each other. But there's a problem here. Not everything got matched up. I suppose that means it's not really a true involution. Oh, there's, but we can decide what's going on here. What are our exceptions? The exceptions, ah, this is important to keep in your mind. The exceptions are the things that are as big as you're allowed to be, that want to grow. They're looking for elbow room. And there is no elbow room. Because in this example, the largest component we're allowed to have in the second position is five. And the things that are not matched up <clears throat> want to go to six, which is not allowed. So how many things are left over every time? How many exceptions are there? Half, just about half. Sometimes that half <clears throat> is a little more. Sometimes it's just exactly right. Okay, so just about half. So the alternating sum of the first n positive integers is, is the ceiling of one half n. And the sign is going to depend on whether that last column is blue or gold. And that last column is gold. When is that last column gold? When n is even. So the even numbers are the ones that correspond to the negatives, which is why there's an n plus 1 there. Okay, So in fact, that is beautiful. He has done it as well. And round two is concluded. That means we are allowed to decide the winner. Oh, this is round one. Of round one. And this is your opportunity. So the middle number is the average of your decibels for the period that it is being um, recorded. And Bob here is the controller. It all relies on you. OK. <clears throat> So first, we, since she went first, we will vote 
on the countess. So, in your hearts, who believes that the countess won? Make noise. Okay, we got a 90, so that's going to be recorded. All right, so now who believes that in fact Sir Matulot won? Oh, you know, I would say that was really close, <clears throat> but I think round one goes to the Countess. All right, good. <coughs> Oh, I have to tell you who the winner is. Hold on. Here. It goes to the Countess. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, round two. What is the challenge this time? The sum and is the binomial coefficient n choose k. And the range is k is going to vary between 0 and n. So, what that means is the countess is going to have to find a closed form for n choose 0 plus n choose 1 all the way up to n choose n. Some of you may know this as adding across a row of Pascal's triangle, which she happens to be wearing. <coughs> okay. And uh, Sir Matulot is supposed to look at the closed form for n choose 0 minus n choose 1 plus n choose 2 all the way out to n choose n with the appropriate sign. OK, because the countess went first last time, we're going to let Sir Matulot go first this time. And it looks like he's raring to go today, folks. He doesn't even need time. So <clears throat> let's see what he does. That's just the regular interpretation of n choose k. There's nothing special going on here. He's looking at subsets of size k. OK, and he, he's going to have to describe his involution. Ah, this is the classic where's Waldo move. <laughs> where's the number one, right? If the number one is there, take it out. If the number one is missing, throw it back in. So we can see if we do the Where's Waldo gambit, everything got matched up. That's nice. OK, I like that. OK, so what are the exceptions? Well, if everything gets matched up, a positive gets matched with a negative, there's nothing left over, we get 0. There are no exceptions. Oh, but wait a minute. There's one problem. I think he's clever enough to see it. It's not 0 when n itself is 0, is it? When n is 0, the sum is just 0 to 0. And for some reason, we like to define those things as equal to 1. <laughs> <clears throat> so that's a problem. OK. Fantastic. Sir Matchlot did a fantastic job. Let us go on to the countess. Well, I think she is really skating along here. She, this is definitely her own backyard. Uh, how many subsets can be formed from 1 to n? Uh, we count the number based on how many elements are in each subset. There might be none. There might be two. There might be n. She adds them all up. She gets the sum she's supposed to look for. Answer two is the total number of subsets, which you and I probably know. I'm sure you know. You know, right? <coughs> Two to the n, right? You look at each element, you say, is this element in or is this element out? So there are a total of 2 to the n. So the answer is the sum across the row of Pascal's formula is 2 to the n. Great. We've done this round. We need to vote. We're going to start with Sir Matchalot. Oh, oh, something. Oh. Now, this isn't in the rule book. Is this something you think we should allow? Yeah. Are you sure? Yeah. OK, you, you really want to allow a generalization. Yeah. Uh, OK, well, let's see. <laughs> I guess game on. OK, let's do our generalizations. Keep the sum n the same, but 
stop the range before you get all the way to the end of the row. Pick some fixed maximum size, M for the element in the set. Fantastic. OK, let's do it. <clears throat> he knows what he's doing. Nothing looks very different here, does it? Absolutely. I mean, the only thing that's different is there are the elements 1 through 5 involved in the subsets. But we're stopping it before he gets to uh, the subset with all five elements if M itself is supposed to be fixed at 3. The largest subset here is supposed to be size 3. But his bijection is exactly the same. OK, that looks good. But what didn't get matched? What are the things that don't have arrows this time? The biggest ones, sorry, I should be on this side. The biggest ones in need of, I feel like, I think it was an old Schoolhouse Rock. Did you guys watch Schoolhouse Rock? Yeah. And it was about settling of the West. It was elbow room, elbow room. You remember that one? I think of that every time. There isn't enough elbow room here. So how many things are in our exceptions? It's the stuff that's as big as you can get with no ones. And so his exceptions are things of size M that can be selected from any of the elements except one. So there are n minus 1 choose M exceptions. Are they positive or negative? Depends. depends. It depends on M. M. It depends on the size of that largest set. And if that size is positive, the contribution will be If that size is even, the contribution will be positive. And if that size is odd, the contribution to the whole sum will be negative. So in fact, he does have a very, very natural generalization. So whew, that was worth it. That was definitely worth it. So now let's see what, oh, shoot. Well, let's see what she can do. Go. Go. Hold on. Technology is fun, isn't it? Go. OK. So we're going, you know, what's unusual here is she hasn't stepped up yet to her performance podium. She's still in the soundproof booth. She's still working on this. So <clears throat> this is rather unusual. And you know, in fact, there is a time limit. If you don't take the stage after a certain amount of time, you will be disqualified. OK, so she's working. OK. <clears throat> Answer, her question is very natural. How many subsets have M or fewer elements? Okay, that is in fact what the sum represents. So that's good. So what's our answer to? She seems a little tentative writing, don't you think? I don't know. She, she doesn't have the same gusto that she's been approaching this with in previous problems. Well, that's sort of a natural idea. It's what we do in probability all the time, right? In probability, if we don't know how to compute something, we, we take 1 minus the probability that something doesn't happen. So that, that seems to, to make sense. But gosh, that sure doesn't look pretty to me. <sighs> or her, I suppose. Um, yeah, yeah, I, could, I, I would say that is not a closed form solution, right? So OK, uh, yes, that's what we want to know the answer to, absolutely. Um, Oh, well, oh, she just failed to come to the podium in time. She, um, oh, she looks a little disturbed, too. <sighs> you know what? It has been proved 
that no closed form formula exists. So no matter how hard she tries, she's not going to be able to answer this question. I don't know, do you think it was a setup? <laughs> or do you think he was just so excited to have a generalization that he didn't think about the ramifications for his, his uh... you think it was a setup? Oh, uh, well, I'm sorry. <laughs> <clears throat> We have to declare him the winner because he successfully created a closed form solution. Okay, he is our winner for round two. All right, round three. We're going to mix up the competition a little bit here. We're going to look at Fibonacci numbers for our sum ends, but we have two choices, and you get to decide which one to put into the competition so that you will be more invested in the answer. So just in case you've never taken Professor Benjamin's discrete math class, okay, just in case you haven't been exposed to the Fibonacci numbers, let me define them for you. Okay, the Fibonacci number little f, there's a discrepancy here, little f of k is the kth Fibonacci number where f, sub, f of 0 is defined to be 1. That's sort of like the binomial 0, 2, 0 is 1. There's one way to do nothing. Okay, so little f of 0 is 1, f of 1 is 1, and for every number Thereafter, we find the next number in the sequence by adding the two previous numbers. So it's 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21, 34, 55, 89. You got it, right? OK. So what are our possible challenges? Challenge one looks at the sum of the first n plus one Fibonacci numbers, starting with the zeros going up to the nth, or the alternating sum of the same. Challenge two looks at the sum of the first n plus one even Fibonacci numbers, or the alternating sum of the same. So I think I'm going to need, in this crowd, we're going to need to judge. So who would like to see challenge one? OK. I think I can probably predict the outcome already, but I like listening to you make noise. Who would like to see challenge two? Okay. I think that was pretty clear. So I think we're going to challenge two. Challenge two. And go. Challenge two. Hey, that worked. I'm always a little worried. Go. So they're off in their soundproof rooms. We're waiting. Okay, we're going to do it the old fashioned way. None of this touch screen stuff. Okay, it's working. OK, they're off in their soundproof rooms. The countess is trying to figure out what her combinatorial representation of the Fibonacci numbers is going to be. And this is so super exciting because there are so many to choose from out there. OK, and you know, it might be binary strings without repeated zeros. It might be tilings with odd length tiles. I mean, there's so many choices. What is she going to pick? Ah, it's a classic. OK, what does f of k count? A 1 by k board, k squares, right? And she's tiling it with squares or dominoes. So if there's a board of length 1, there's only one way to tile it, namely a square. So f of 1 is 1. Okay, if it's a board of length two, okay, two squares or a domino, there are two tilings. Okay, but we didn't start one one, did we? 
We started one, two. Okay, well, we're going to just let it go. She's just working off in her corner here. It doesn't, it's not going to count against her yet. So she's still thinking through this. All right, the, the tilings of length three, I, I like that. that. That makes good sense. There are three of them. It's important to realize that um, we're not paying attention to rotational symmetries here. So notice that square domino and domino square are actually counted as two different tilings. So we don't have to worry about symmetry. Oh, look at how she's creating the tilings of length four. She copied the tilings of length three down. She copied the tilings of length two down. And to the tilings of length three, she appended a square. And to the tilings of length two, she appended a domino. OK, so there are five. Those numbers look good. They look like what we just said, right? One, two, three, five. And in general, let's, let's just bring it home. Let's see what she can do for us. If you look at a long tiling, you can pay attention to how it ends, right? It can only end one of two ways. It can either end with a square or it can end with a domino. If it ends with a square, length k, end with a square, you got a choice for everything that's left. And there are k plus 1 things left. So it's going to be the number of Fibonacci tilings of length k minus 1. If it ends with a domino, we've already specified two of the k positions. So there are k minus 2 positions left to specify. So in fact, this does satisfy the Fibonacci recurrence. And if we define the zeroth tiling to be able to be done one way, we're good. We're good all the way through our initial conditions. And there's one way to, to put down the empty tiling. Just don't do it. <laughs> OK? OK. So I think she's ready. She has her work all clear. Question, how many square domino tilings of length, I don't know where she pulled this out, 2n plus 1 contain at least one square? OK, let's go with it. Let's see what she can say. OK, 2n plus 1. <coughs> so count the tilings based on the location of the last square. Oh, I can get my brain around that. OK, if there's a, top, a square in the very, very last position, there are 2n cells remaining to be tiled. So there will be f of 2n ways to finish that tiling. OK, where can the next square go? To the left. How far to the left? Two. Two. Do you see that I can't, she can't put a square one cell over. Because if she puts a, cell, a square one cell over, then she's got to end it with a square. So the last square is still the last cell. So the only place she can put this square so it's uniquely the last square is two cells over. So if there were f of 2n ways to finish the first tiling, there are f of 2n minus 2 ways to finish the second. And then she puts this, the last square Two more over. So we're going to get an f of 2n minus 4. And two more over. And two more over. Until we get all the way to the very end. So it's one square followed by all kinds of dominoes. And, and there's a zero tiling at the beginning to finish. And how many ways can we do the zero tiling? One way. So that one still counts. It counts once. So look, you add all those up, and you get the answer. You get the first answer is the sum as specified in the problem. The second answer is the combinatorial interpretation she worked so hard to get, f of 2n plus 1. So she has solved this problem as well. Whew. Lovely. Lovely indeed. OK, let's try Sir Matulux. <sighs> OK, given k between 0 and 2n, fk counts tilings of length k. 
Uh, yes. Uh, so the blue things, which are our positive things, look at the blue things, f of 0, f of 4, f of 8, f of 12, f of 16. So the blue things are the positive objects, and they're the even length boards and the number of tilings that are divisible by four in terms of length. The negative objects, f of 2, f of 6, those are the tilings whose length is even and not divisible by 4, a.k.a. the tilings of length 2 mod 4, right? So he has to now find an involution between the blue set and the gold set. Okay? What's the involution going to be? Look at the middle of the tiling. It's even, right? There is an absolute middle point. That's good, right? Every length is divisible by two. Look at the middle point. If it's breakable at the middle, pull it apart and put a domino in. That's what the toggle is. If it's not breakable at the middle, there's a domino there. Yank it out. So let's just look at that for a minute. If it's breakable, as it is on top, pull it apart, put a domino in. If it's not breakable, there's a domino there, yank it out. One of those has a length divisible by four. I don't know which one, but one of them does. The other one, I've changed the length by two. So one of them's positive and one of them's negative. So they will, in fact, cancel out. So all that remains is to look for the exceptions. When can't we do this? So as big as we get, the longest one has a breakable spot. Okay, so if it's breakable in the middle, if it's breakable in the middle, there's a length end tiling here, there's a length end tiling there, so it's Fn choices times Fn choices. It's Fn squared, and it's going to be positive or negative depending on whether n was even or odd. Phew, we did it. He did it. He did it. We're done. We can vote for round three. OK, we're ready to vote for round three. OK, who do you want to vote? Let's vote for the countess first. Who believes, Bob, it's your job. <coughs> who believes for round three, the countess won? <laughs> 88 seems to be a popular number. <coughs> All right. Who believes for round two, Sir Matchalot won? Ooh, oh, that was close. You know, you wouldn't have trusted me with just my ears on that one. So I'm really glad we have an unbiased method. All right, okay, so let's go uh, on here. So let's sum. I just love these contestants, don't you? Wow, another challenge. A classic Fibonacci identity. Ooh. Do you think he's me? I think he just has confidence. OK. Oh, Binet's formula. Are you familiar with Binet's formula? That's, that's the, that's the crazy, irrational formula for what the nth Fibonacci number is. And yes, we're going to count irrational things. That is exciting. OK, let's see what we do. There is Binet's formula. OK, OK, wait a minute. I, I got to point something out here. Those are big Fs. Those are Fibonacci Association approved Fs. They're no little Fs. Okay, big F 
Notice for big F, F of zero is defined as zero. It is a shift of this sequence a little. Why would we bother shifting the sequence? It looks prettier. Because then the index of the Fibonacci number matches the exponent of the golden ratio, right? That looks pretty. So there is a time and a place for big Fs. And there is a time and a place for little Fs. So don't you be haters one way or the other, OK? I want you to embrace both versions. OK, so that's what she wants to prove. Uh, and uh, you know, I can, I can approve of this. Writing out 1 plus the square root of 5 over 2 and 1 minus the square root of 5 over 2 in a timed situation, <laughs> it's a bear. So phi, the golden ratio, is going to be 1 plus the square root of 5 over 2. And its conjugate is 1 minus the square root of 5 over 2. And it also happens to be negative 1 over phi. They're beautiful, beautiful properties there. OK. Oh, look, she has to go use little f's anyways. But look how ugly it becomes when we change it from big f's to little f's. You just really want those things to match. <sighs> OK, so if we change from big f's to little f's, we're slightly off in our indexing. But that's what she's going to prove. OK, I'm ready. <laughs> It's up there in the corner if you want to see it. What is the probability that an infinite tiling is breakable after cell n? OK, well, she better define some stuff for us here. What does she mean by an infinite tiling? OK, we're going to consecutively place tiles where a square is placed with probability 1 over phi and a domino is placed with probability 1 over phi squared. Does anybody know what 1 over phi plus 1 over phi squared equals? One. So that means there's no other choice out there. It's either a square or a domino at every stage in the decision process. OK, so either we're here. <laughs> square domino, square domino, square domino. OK, and we just keep going. OK, so we want to compute the probability that we're breakable after cell n. OK, next question. What's the probability that a tiling of length n is all squares? One over phi raised to the nth power, because you take the product of all those probabilities, right? What's the probability that a tiling of even length n is all dominoes? One over phi squared raised to the n over 2, which is really just one over phi raised to the n. Oh. So any tiling, what's the probability that any tiling of length n, you name the tiling, I want the probability that it is the one I pick. What is the probability that it occurs? One over phi raised to the n. That's nice. That's pretty. OK. With that, answer one is the probability that you pick a tiling is 1 over phi to the n. And you pick the next tiling is 1 over phi to the n. And you pick a different tiling. How many of those tilings are there? f of n of them. You add all those probabilities up, you're going to get f sub n over phi to the n. Answer one. Good. Answer two. Doing probability. Need another answer. What do you do? One minus the probability that it's not, right? So let's do 1 minus the probability that it's not breakable at n. So if this is n right here, and it's not breakable, what do you know? This is a domino. What is the probability that the domino occurred? 1 over phi squared. What about the stuff at the beginning? Well, it's the probability that it's not breakable here at n minus 1, right? Because, uh huh. So we're good. OK, oh, so q of n minus 1 over phi squared, subtract that from 1. We've got two answers. Set them equal to each other. OK, two answers, 
set them equal to each other. Huh. Well, it's a little bit of algebra. I don't know if that counts. Maybe we should disqualify her. <laughs> but she's doing a little bit of algebra. She's going to unravel it. 1 minus q to the n minus 1 over phi squared. Well, you get rid of that q minus uh, q to the n minus 1, so it becomes inside 1 minus q minus q of n minus 2, 2 over phi to the fourth, and you keep going. The sign's going to change each time you do it. So you end up with a geometric series. Okay? The geometric series unravels all the way down to q0 here, which is 1. There's a geometric series with a ratio of negative 1 over phi squared. There's a nice closed form for all these geometric series. Here it is. And notice, if you take this, you set it equal to f sub n over phi to the n. We want, she's looking for f sub n. All she's going to have to do is multiply both sides by phi to the n. But there's already a phi here. So that makes phi to the n plus 1 that gets distributed through. And then she gets exactly what Binet's formula is in the little f notation. So that, my friends, is really a very beautiful way of finding Binet's formula by counting something. So you had to do unusual weights to get there, these probabilistic weights. But it was doable. OK. Oh, fantastic. We have a solution. We have a competition here. So let's see what we have going on. Oh. He's tiling a 1 by n board with squares and dominoes. But there are two kinds of squares here. There's a square that's yellow or gold that has weight phi. There's a square that's green that has weight phi bar. And there's a domino that has weight 1. Okay? I don't know what weights mean yet, but we're weighting square tilings with colors. Oh, there's some special stuff here about first tiles. Okay, First tiles. <laughs> Uh, initial, so there's something funky going on with the weighting. Just remember there's something special going on in the first tile. Okay, phi over the square root of 5, negative phi bar over the square root of 5, and the initial domino has a weight of 0. What do we do with these weights? Okay, so here's an example of what's going on. So the tiling weight is going to be the product of the individual tiles. Okay, the product weight is the product of the individual tiles. So for this tiling, there's one phi, there's five phi bars, there are two ones, and there's one negative one over the square root of five. So the weight of this tiling, whoops, the weight of this tiling is the negative of phi times phi bar to the fifth over square root of five. Just take the product of everything you see there. Okay. The purple haze is the Seattle influence here. Okay, so the purple haze means that something special is happening for that first tile. And you just have to trust me that I remember what it is. Okay, so that's what's happening there. Okay, so the, that's the weight of the tiling. Okay, Del the description is to look at the sum of all weighted n tilings when n is big. Okay, what does that mean? Okay, if we take a weighted end tiling, it either ends with a yellow square, a green square, or a purple domino. And the weights are given accordingly in the picture. Okay, so if we were to ask what the recurrence is, okay, the recurrence is going to be phi times the weights of length n minus 1 plus phi bar times the lengths of the weights of lengths n minus 1 times 1 plus 1 times the lengths of uh, the weights of length n minus 2. So that's the recurrence. It doesn't look Fibonacci yet. But I do like the distributive law, and I do like to factor. There's a w of n minus 1 in those first two terms. And what is phi plus phi bar? 1. 1. So now that looks better. Yes. OK, so we really do have the same recurrence happening. Ooh. 
I think he skipped checking the initial conditions. Okay, let's think about this for a minute. <sighs> Tiling of length zero. How many are there? E, I'm not even sure. Let's not do that. Let's do tiling of length one. How many are there? <coughs> phi plus phi bar. And what did you tell me phi plus phi bar was? One. So there's one of length one. Tilings of length two. How many are there? Uh, let's see. Hmm. Square root of five. So it's going to, okay, so how are we going to do this? The, it's, it's going to be, we can do this. I can do this in my head. Can you do this in your head? I don't have it down. Okay. <laughs> length two. It's going to be yellow, green, green, yellow, or domino, purple, right? What's the weight of an initial purple? Zero. So we can just ignore it. What's the weight of yellow, green? That's going to be phi times phi bar over square root of five. Phi times, what's phi times phi bar? One, phi, one? Negative one, phi times phi bar is a negative one, so it's gonna be negative one over square root of five. Okay, and what's the other one? Did I do that right? Oh, I forgot yellow, yellow, green, green. Oh, well let's do the two different ones we have. Okay, okay, good, this is good. So yellow, green, green, yellow. That's going to be negative phi bar over square root of 5 times phi. Oh, that's just the opposite of the one we had, right? If it's the opposite of the one we had, it's going to cancel out the one we just had. So now we only have to worry about yellow, yellow, and green, green. Yellow, yellow is phi squared over root 5. Green, green is negative phi bar squared over root 5, and that's what that says when n is 2. So it actually does match. Okay, so initial conditions. I don't think he did them, but I think they work. So, <laughs> so now let's look at the involution. He's looking for the first domino or the first occurrence of where you have two squares with different colors. So when there's an initial domino, copy everything. He's yanked that domino out, and he's going to replace it with two squares of different colors. But the, the, the order of those colors is important. It has to, the first square has to match the squares that came before it. Because if you made that first square yellow, the position of the first pair would be different. Okay, so it has to match what came before it. OK, so that's an interesting pair. And again, what's phi times phi bar? Negative 1. If phi times phi bar is negative 1, the weight of the top tiling and the weight of the second tiling in magnitude are exactly the same. But in sign, they're opposite. So you match them up, and they annihilate each other. They go away, and they give you 0. OK, let's look at it again. If you start with. Uh, uh, an order of, of squares that are different, pull them out and replace them with a domino. Again, the weights are going to differ by negative 1, so they will annihilate each other. That's fabulous. But there's this problem that we haven't quite taken into account, which is when this, this domino or these two different color squares occur at the very, very beginning. We haven't, he hasn't taken that into account. Because when it occurs at the very, very beginning, <sighs> what happens? Well, we sort of saw this in checking the initial conditions, right? When it's yellow, green versus green, yellow, the weights of those two are, the, are opposite. So they'll get rid of each other. And if it is a domino that starts the beginning, the weight of zero is going to just wipe everything out. So it all goes away. So almost everything is going away in this matching. What's left? All green and all yellow tilings. The all yellow tilings, the tiling that's all phi, it has a weight of phi to the n over square root of 5. 
The tiling that has a weight of all green has a weight of negative, that's why we need that at the beginning, negative phi bar to the n over square root of 5. We add those weights together to get our exceptions. That is Binet's formula. It's just the exceptions. That's beautiful. So I think we need to vote on who won the challenge. All right, so who won round one? The Countess. Oh, I hope this works. Let me see, I need to get far enough back so I can see it. Okay, who won round, oh, he won round two, right? Who won round three? Sir Matchelot by one. And now we need to decide who wins the challenge. So, because the challenge initiated with the Countess, I believe we should vote first for the Countess. So who believes that the probabilistic approach to Binet's formula is far superior and more elegant than her opponents? Go! <laughs> Ouch! Wow! <coughs> and who believes that the weighted tiling approach with weights of irrational quantities is the superior technique. Go! Oh, so I think that means the winner of this round is the Countess. Oh. Should we do another round? <laughs> All right. I think that means we declare a tie for the champion. Oh. It sort of does your heart good, doesn't it? Wonderful. OK. Oops, you didn't need to see that. <laughs> OK, so let's bring it up. Fun. Wonderful fun. Thank you for indulging me. But what's the whole point? Okay. <laughs> Everything done here was with one of two techniques. Either you asked a counting question and you answered it two different ways, as the countess did, or you sort of followed this DIE method, description, involution, and exception. Describe the set, figure out what's positive and negative, match them up as best you can, figure out what the exceptions are. Great. So what else happened in this match? There was lots of challenging to generalizations, right? And I love combinatorics. <laughs> I love combinatorics. I love these very playful, puzzle-like proofs. And I often get asked, well, what good are those? That's already known. But what's interesting in the process is if you can really get your hands on the solution, if you, can see, um, if you can see how the parts are playing together, then you can push it even further. Okay, you can figure out how to change those parameters, how to add irrational weights, and get even further in your understanding of a problem. So yes, Sir Matchelot can take his technique and apply it to any linear recurrence and, and count a closed form solution for that as well. Uh, sometimes it doesn't work, as we saw in the Countess's round two defeat, but sometimes it does. So yes, start with the natural generalizations. Always ask yourself, solve a problem, and ask what's the natural generalization of what I just did. And that will help you be one step further towards being a real productive <laughs> mathematician. Okay. Uh, and here are my disclaimers. Um, I did not draw my avatars, but it's one of my very favorite artists, Greg Nemec, um, who drew them for me. And he worked for us a lot in Math Horizons. You may have seen his work there. And it was just so much fun to work with him to create these avatars. I did not present using doceri today, um, but I love it. If you want to know more about it, 
upgrade issues with iOS 7. So <laughs> um, it, it was causing me problems, and we went old school with the clicker. Uh, and then there's just more information there if you want to follow any of this further. So thank you for your time and your enthusiasm and your energy.